Welcome to the Messy Antics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Hey everyone, uh, this is Rabbi Toby. Uh, you're listening to the Messy Antics podcast, and uh, but we are uh, we're here in uh, at Brit Am Messianic Synagogue. It's uh, we're in Pensacola, and uh, it is nice enough. I mean, it's not as sunny as it was last time we were out here, but it does feel very nice out. And we just decided to do this outside again. You may pick up a guy uh, mowing the lawn in the property next Blowing door. leaves or something. I don't know what he's doing, but we can't go over there and stop him because he's doing it at the other property. <laughs> so if you pick that up, uh, you know, sorry about that. But we are, we're out here having, having a good time. And uh, we, this week we decided that once again, we're just going to kind of chat. We're going to kind of see where, where the conversation goes. Uh, we really enjoyed doing that. But um, Rabbi Eric, of course, he missed out on that. So he gets to join our candid discussion. So, yeah, I felt um, a little jealous last week when I listened to it and said, these guys were having fun without me. And <laughs> I felt a little bad about that. But then I realized I was on the Mexican beach while they were doing this and i hope they felt a little bad about that in florida's well how uh, was the it, florida's mullet as, as david said well how was the yeah well how was the cruise it was it was excellent we had our intercongregational cruise once a year we invite people to come and do and we do a cruise retreat where we have studies and services worship things like that while we're out there and build relationship and community with each other so it was really nice although it is funny we live in pensacola which has one of the nicest beaches in the world and so when I go to other places and people are getting off the boat and going, I can't wait to get to the beach. I'm always sitting there going, I'm not in all that much of a hurry to go to a beach that's not as nice as the one that's where I live. So uh, although it was a beautiful place to be, uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't home, wasn't home. And but we did have a great time and we encourage any of the listeners that want to go next year on our intercongregational cruise that you uh, keep watching on Messiantic's Facebook page. We'll let you know when it's going to be so you can start booking your cabins and join us as we worship on the high seas. And find your sea legs. And typically there's you know three or four rabbis uh, representing their congregations on the ship and um, every day there's a small like short little community worship service together and uh and you'll get to hear from each of the different rabbis uh depending on the the day uh get to hear them teach a little bit it's not like overbearing yeah. it's not a conference but it, we do like to get together and, and spend a little time together and worship and uh digging into the word uh as a community right and then we do karaoke together we do miniature golf together there's, there's no we, we in do, that well <laughs> some do karaoke together some miniature golf we do trivia together we you know it's it's really about building a community building relationships getting together with people uh rabbi david is saying that he practices is doing kiddush over and over on the ship for uh, so that he can make sure he is well versed in doing kiddush. Somebody's going to make sure the boat's blessed. That's yeah. right, <laughs> sanctified. So, <laughs> it made me. Th- I don't know what made this come into my mind. Probably because we were talking about it a little bit before. Uh, so I'm an assistant rabbi to Rabbi David at Congregation Mayim Chaim in Daphne, Alabama. David's the senior rabbi. Uh, rabbi Eric is the senior rabbi here at Bradam, and Jonathan is his assistant. So I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to talk about just one of the things that I'm really happy with where I'm at right now because I see a lot of what the senior rabbi has to deal with. And I know he's the first line of defense, even though he brings me in to assist on matters, whether it's, you know, maybe conflict within the synagogue or just having to meet with certain people or, uh, you know, those kinds of things. But I think the one thing that makes me happy when I'm the assistant is when we bring in a guest because when you bring in a guest, whether it's a guest speaker, it could be a guest musician to come and bless your congregation, you have to understand you're bringing in a person that has their own way of doing things, their own way of living. And I just, it would stress me out to the nth degree to make sure that, like, I'm accommodating this person. Because, you, know, you know, David and Danny have told me their stories, and some of them are very interesting. Yeah. But I just, those are moments. But, you know, you have those moments where you're like, okay, I'm glad I'm just the right-hand guy. I'm not the main dude, you know? Well, there are interesting things that happen when you invite people in to, uh, to your congregation. Everything from we had a, a singer one time come in and do a wonderful worship service for us, and then I was standing next to him after the service, and one of the people that attends our congregation uh, came up and asked the singer if he would sign his ripped 
uh, CD. You know, he, he made a copy. It wasn't like I bought your CD yeah, from that's you. Weird. That's awkward. And I uh, and you know, would you? But he ripped and copied a CD and then brought it up and said, "I stole this move music from you. Would you please sign it for me?" So well, he, that, didn't, he didn't say it in those many words. I don't think. Right, but that was the the that's action much, of it. That's, 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 that's the, the uh, reality. You know that we have. Uh, that's the inference we can pull from it. Yeah, I can't tell you the number of times. Now we've been blessed. We've had some of the the best singers, some of the most powerful. Powerful speakers in Messianic Judaism that have come and you're welcome and and uh, s- spoke for <laughs> sang for us. Pardon? But they're, they're, they're yeah they're. <laughs> <laughs> My son, to, to get to the Purim story, my son, uh, his very first time speaking at Berdam, now this has been 20 years ago. Uh, well, I the had first him. time, but it, we were, this was... Uh, at, when you were at I school. I was in school. I was in college in New York, came down for spring break to visit the family, and you had asked me to speak here. Uh, yeah, and I asked him to speak on Purim because I thought... <clears throat> It's Purim. It's the story of Esther and Mordechai and Hamon. There's what nothing he can do to ruin this. <laughs> you know, that, well, let, give him this opportunity, and Here, he gets up. Uh, you're throwing him a softball. Yeah, he. Hold yeah, I threw him bear. the softball. This was, there was no way he couldn't hit at least a, a double, if not a triple, on that. And uh, he gets up there and he goes. Uh, so some of you think that the story of Esther is about a, a beauty pageant. <laughs> But uh, I'm telling you, it yeah. wasn't a beauty pageant. It was a test drive. And it was uh, a moment where, you know, everybody in the room just kind of stood there and said, did he actually just say that? Now, the truth is that's an accurate statement, but it's not generally the statement that you make when... Uh, Look, you're not wrong. Yeah, you're but, not wrong. However. But you're not right either. <laughs> yeah, you can be wrong about being right, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's you know, and, and, and but... but you know, I, I I think about like these awkward moments, like uh, Rabbi Eric shared about you know the musical artists. I think what would scare me the most, honestly, uh, would be or would stress me out the most would be to make sure that I provide uh, accommodations that th- that that the guest appreciates, whether it's putting them in a hotel that's not uh, a flea bag hotel, or even if they stay at your home. You want to hope that they're comfortable there. <laughs> not gonna lie, no doubt about it. The 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 biggest. Uh mental hurdle to get over when you have guests come in is uh especially as the leadership of the congregation is preparing yourself for the fact that you know there's going to be no matter who it is you bring in to speak there's going to be at least one person that's going to come up and complain about they're going to call you up that week they're going to send you an email about you know i can't believe this one thing that was said do you agree with this do you you're like look guys we're they're they're not me. They're not our. They're coming in representing their ministry. You know, we we brought them, but you, you don't have to be so uptight about uh, stuff. But they, I think for me, it's always that reality. That there's always going to be that one person. Yeah, and there's always the the technical issues that come. Those kind of things that come up when you have guest speakers. We had uh, one speaker come, and he was doing a a class, and his entire message was on. His PowerPoint, all his notes, everything was on the PowerPoint, and a squirrel committed Harry Carey on the power transformer out in front of the building and took our power out. So here we're about to have Shabbat service. We have no electricity in the building, so none of our worship instruments are going to play. The sound system isn't working. The PowerPoint isn't working, and we have a guest speaker in whose entire message is is on PowerPoint so he can present it to the congregation in that way. So that's probably our, our biggest uh, technical issue with a guest speaker that's ha- that's taken place uh, is the, the entire, you know, blackout of the building on Saturday morning. And I think I think, I think our biggest technical issue was Hurricane Sally. Yeah, Hurricane Sally because, was probably a pretty big technical because issue. Because for, like, for, for 10 months, we were transient while our building was being restored. So I kept getting emails and calls from uh, guest speakers or, or recording artists or whatever. Hey, can we come in and, 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 and uh, share at your congregation? I'm like, not right now. <laughs> we, Later. Yeah, it's a little complicated at the moment. Uh, let's, re, let's revisit this in a year or so. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember even when I was here within the first six months, like it was... Just about every time I would speak, you would get a phone call during the next office hours of the week. Someone would be like, I'm not so sure about what he said. Speaking of <laughs> speaking outside guests, inquiring minds would like to know, Rabbi Eric, do you still get up after everyone, including Jonathan, and go, well, that was great, but... <laughs> I, I do not do that behind everybody. Uh, 
So, hasn't done so, that behind me in a while. No, <laughs> it's, it's been a while. The, the follow-up <laughs> sermon to the sermon. So, but uh, yeah, I have done that in the past, especially when David was speaking, because <laughs> you know when when David would speak here, I'd want to make sure the people at least got fed something. So at the end of the message, I would just drop something on there, so they had a little caviar to go with their uh, test drive. Their, oh, <laughs> there, there, there was. Um, there was someone at our um speaking of jonathan rabbi jonathan made me think of this but um there was uh and these i don't know where they're at now they don't go to our congregation anymore but i know i upset someone one week uh because somebody else in the congregation told me like hey you made these people over here mad i said why he said well because you said that abraham as in father abraham the patriarch uh was sinful at times. And I said, well, dang, he was. Every single person in the Bible except Yeshua was. That's the whole point. That's why the Bible's so encouraging. That's I share that as yeah. encouragement. I'm not dumping on him or, or, like, say, King David. I said, but Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all committed sins. And Abraham's, I mean... Yeah, w- each of them in their own way were train wrecks. Right. And I said, that should be a source of... And he goes, no, man, they're not okay with it. They're like, how could you say he was sinful? I'm like, how could you say they're not? Yeah. Yeah, that that particular conversation was that they, uh, and it was funny because I had said something the week before, and I, I basically said that Abraham uh, telling Sarah to to say that she was his sister, um, and so that he wouldn't get killed for her. I was like, you know, that's it's pretty messed up. Like that's a pretty messed up scenario because Abraham basically was like, look. I don't care what happens to you. I just want to make sure I don't die. Yeah. So if you would just, right. you know, you, I mean, uh, they took her to be their wife. There was a lot of things that could go wrong uh, in that scenario. And I was like, it's kind of a dirtbag move. And so they were upset about that. And then Toby followed the next week. It was, uh, you kind of doubled Just down. Hammer, hammered really down on that point. It. Yeah, down because on it. I, I, I simply am trying, because part of, I guess, my heart when I'm sharing the scripture is, let's have an honest picture of each of our biblical heroes. Yeah. No, I'm not saying let's not look at their successes. But you can't look at their successes without looking at the fact, yeah. without their accompanying failures. Right, yeah. it's like and King God's David, yeah. who's you know a man after God's own heart. People love that verse. But when you think of the fact that David was a murderer, a woman, rapist, sex trafficker, possible idolater. You know that yes. that you know, but when we look at the clarity of the scripture in in its fullness, but it's also interesting. I can say something from the bim of when I'm speaking, and no one will say anything about it. Rabbi Jonathan can say the same thing, and all of a sudden, it's a tragic consequence that needs immediate attention. Right. We're, we're so, over this young guy. So it's just it's, interesting how all that happens, and and so we've had, like I said, we've had people that have bloods. come. That's right. We've yeah. had people that have come, and we've had technical issues. We've had people that have come, and, and they've said stuff. Had technical issues. That were... Have, te- have technical <laughs> issues. Uh, we've, had, we've had people that have come and said things that uh, would have gone... I am the technical issue. That, that have you know gone against things that we would normally hold to and, and had to fix those things, and you end up getting the phone calls about, can you believe he mentioned that or this or... Um, you know those kind of things. So it's it's interesting. It's always a risk when you invite someone to come to your congregation because you're trusting them with your sheep, with your people, and that they're not going to do any damage that you can't fix. Yeah, um, there was, and this is this is, gosh, this is like 15 years ago. This happened um, at, at the first congregation I attended. We invited a guy from Israel. He's a rabbi, not not a believer in Yeshua, but he was involved in the uh, the Temple Institute, which is, you know, about that the, they're. I, I haven't followed them in a while, so I don't know if they're. I, I, I'm sure they're still active. Oh yeah, they're, they're, yeah, it's still very active. Okay, yeah. so he invites, we invite him, and he gives just a talk basically on what they're doing and stuff. It, you know, everybody knew this guy didn't believe. Uh, d- didn't accept Yeshua as Messiah, you know, uh, that he was an Orthodox rabbi, uh, to my, if, if I'm correct. Um, and uh, it was a very nice guy. He was very sweet, very, very warm and welcoming and shared a lot of good stuff. But what was funny was when our rabbi got up after it was all over and said, um, you know, and, and, and just basically laid out, we know Yeshua is Messiah, and we know that when this temple's built, he's the one that's going to sit in it. And that dude was just sitting there. Everybody kind of got up and clapped, and that dude just sat there with his legs crossed. He did not move one bit. And I was like, man, uh, I was like, how did that go over with him? He goes, I don't know how it went over with him, but I'm sure he was happy with the offering he got. <laughs> so, 
So I want to ask a quick question. Rabbi Eric and I are are, um, partnering on a tour to, uh, to Israel. Uh, this will be the first one that we've partnered on uh, officially, uh, but the, 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 we're partnering on a tour to Israel and uh, really looking forward to it. But it had me think about this, and I don't know, uh, Rabbi Jonathan, have you been to Israel yet? I have not been to okay, Israel I know yet. That, I know Rabbi Toby hasn't. I think Rabbi Eric's been once. It's actually... No, uh, <laughs> but but I do... It, 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 Just a couple of beers. Right. It brings, up, it brings up a uh, it brings up an intriguing question. You know, one of the one of the beauties of going to Israel is getting to experience um, the Bible come to life. Right? You get to walk around the sites where the actual events that we read about in the Tanakh and Brachat Shah occurred, where these things were, were laid out, where prophecy was fulfilled and, and revealed and, and so on. Um... And so the question I have for, for, for really everybody at the table is, uh, and, and Rabbi Eric and I have both been, and, and, and Rabbi Toby and Rabbi Jonathan have not been, but uh, a, a, going to Israel, uh, just uh, if you were on a hypothetical trip to Israel, going to Israel, what is the single most important site in Israel that you would like to see, experience, and why? Uh, Mount of Olives. Yeah, simply because you should have spent so much time praying there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, it's... Um, I don't know, I look at it as kind of like, you know, if you're a disciple, you're kind of obligated to visit where your teacher went or goes. And so, you know, I'm like, I mean, so Mount of Olives for me would be a big one to go to and, and to and to pray, like to mm-hmm. go, like to get up early, leave the hotel and to go and have an early morning, like as the sun is rising, yeah. go and just spend time in prayer and in the word. Yeah, that's good. Uh, for me, um, the... Uh, the Kinneret, uh, which is the Sea of Galilee, uh, so much happened there. Uh, yeah, from Yeshua teaching to Peter's restoration, which you know, obviously we don't know the exact place, but we know it was on the shore. They've got a pretty solid idea on where it likely was. Oh wow! Yeah, and that's to me that's one of the most beautiful moments in Scripture. It's one of my favorite parts of Oddly the entire. Oddly enough, it's a Catholic site now, but, <laughs> um, but <laughs> most of them are. Yeah. So Sorry. the, the Kinneret and um, Angeti. Because I know that that we know that that's where David at some point hid from King Saul. Uh, these places where um, you know, and and that, so that's that's Tanakh and that's Brit Chadashah. You know, you know. So the Kinneret for Brit Chadashah and for as far as the Tanakh, I would love to go um, to Engedi and 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 just look at the caves and know that man at one point King David was just hiding in there yeah. and and God was you know providing for him and and. Uh, it was such an integral part of of the people of Israel's history, and yeah, yeah. There, there's four things I love to to point out to people or bring when they go to Israel. One is, of course, the the Temple Mount, which you know is so central to our faith. It's where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. It's the, where the temple stood. It's where all these events happened. What? Where, where Abraham tied Sa- up Isaac? Sa- he sacrificed him. He, he didn't. He didn't kill him, but he put him on there. He sacrificed him. So anyhow, so that's one place. Uh, Caesarea Philippi, which is the place where uh, Peter says, "You are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God." It's the gates of hell. Uh, when the Scripture says, "And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it," there's actually a place called the gates of hell uh, in Caesarea Philippi. It's a really powerful uh, statement. I love to go to. Um, Megiddo to the place where Armageddon, you know, the the Battle of Armageddon, which actually isn't the Battle of Armageddon. Yeah. The yeah. battle actually takes place in Jerusalem. The troops gather together in the Valley of Megiddo. Yeah, I asked, uh, I asked Rabbi David not to cut you off, but I asked Rabbi David, I said, you've seen it. I said, does it look like a place where a battle would, you know, take place or where he goes, oh yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah the, the that's where the troops all gather mm-hmm. together to fight in Jerusalem. The actual, there's no Battle of Armageddon. There's the Battle of Jerusalem. So it's a big plain? It's a big valley, valley. Uh, yeah. that, that's there. And it's it's just an amazing huge, place to, valley, to yeah. see. But, Beautiful. But to remind people that the the valley is where the the soldiers gather. It's not right, right. actually where, where the, the, the battle takes place. Yeah. And the the fourth place is thing that I think is is really powerful is uh, as Rabbi David said, when you go there, you see the scriptures come to life. It becomes real. You can place yourself inside the text in a lot of ways. Normally, when you land, you land in, in Tel Aviv Airport, uh, and then you go to Joppa, which is where. Um, 
Peter is when, or, or Cornelius is when he sends for Peter. The, the whole thing goes on, and then, or I'm sorry, Peter is when Cornelius sends for him. And then you drive up the coast to Caesarea, which is where the event happens, and you, then you realize how far that is. That, that wasn't like walking across town. Right. That's like walking up the entire coast of Israel, just about from the from the bottom to the top along the coastline, from Tel Aviv Jaffa to Caesarea, and and the mountains and the, the the trail. This was not, you know, like hey, walk up to Publix and get me some milk or whatever. This was a, a big trip that he took to get there, and just putting yourself in that story and seeing how significant this trip actually was, the journey was, how arduous it was, uh, traveling over the mountains, the rocks, all the things that go on. It's just pretty amazing to see that and put yourself in that place and understand that there's more to the story than just, you know, Peter had this vision while he was up on the rooftop and was told to go to Cornelius' house, and, and he walked across the street to Cornelius' house, and, and that was it, you know. But this is like the length of, of Israel on the coast yeah. mm-hmm. that he goes to, to to go from Jaffa to uh, Caesarea. Yeah, I'd really like to walk the road to Emmaus as well. Like, that's been pretty well... Um, I, I hate to say paved because it's not really paved, but you know people have taken care to make sure that a path actually exists um, there now. And so, like I remember, I watched this young couple one time record their journey on YouTube, uh, walking the road to a mass, and, and it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool because it's about a day's. Walk. I mean, you can do it in a day. You know, the walk. It's still a long walk, but. It was, you know, it was kind of fun to see, like, oh, yeah, I'd like to do that. That'd be kind of fun to go and I do. I heard a, a young lady one time sharing at one of the conferences about a youth group that had gone to Israel on a, a trip, the the young messianic group that had gone. And uh, the people involved in the trip said, okay, we're going somewhere special tonight. Um, so, you know, make plans. We're going to get on the bus at this time and we'll take you there. And so it was one of the last nights of their tour, so the girls all got, they heard special, so they got dressed up, they healed the whole, you know, in their nice clothes. Right. And then they had them walk, they get off the bus in this wilderness area, and they're walking this path, and as they're walking, they're complaining about... Uh, you know, here we are all dressed up and we're walking through all this and this, you know, and just moaning and groaning. And when they get to the end of the walk, they come to this clearing and the person leading the tour says, do you know where you are? And they said, no. Do you know what you just did? No. You were just walking on the road to Emmaus. And it kind of broke them because they were complaining Mm. about this journey (laughs) <laughs> kind of like the disciples were when they were on the road to, to Emmaus, and they were complaining about Yeshua died, what are we going to do, what's going on, all of that while Yeshua was walking with them on this road, and yeah. just how meaningful that walk was uh, as they went. For me, there, there's actually a couple of things. One is that the, the one site that I love going to and, and I'm looking forward to most on this trip is uh, Tel Shiloh. Uh, which is in, in the north. It's where the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, stood um, in Israel's history for 370-something years of memory serves, 360-something, 370-something years before it was moved to Jerusalem. Wow. And uh, what's really interesting about it is that they've, they've pretty well, like, when you go to the Kotel, the, the Western Wall, right, it's the closest place we can get to outside of the tunnels. It's the closest place we can get to to where the temple once stood, to where the Holy of Holies once stood, which is why it's deemed such a holy site, because it's, it's, it's as close as we, it's really a retaining wall, a retention wall, but it's it's as close as we can get to where the Holy of Holies once stood. Uh, but you can go to Tel Shiloh, and you can stand on the very ground that the Holy of Holies stood. Uh, for 370 years, give or take. Um, I mean, it's just an absolutely unreal uh, thing. And for me, I talked about this in in our Bible study last night. Um, For me... Uh, the I think the the biggest mistake that Israel ever made, and and I don't want to like mitigate the the prophetic purpose to it uh, to the temple, but I think one of the biggest mistakes that Israel ever made was building the temple, the physical temple, uh, because it was a permanent dwelling place. Like we caged the presence of God yeah. in, in this permanent dwelling place in Jerusalem, which is why when David first approached God about it, I was like, never asked for one. Like I, you know, you think I need this temple because all these other gods around you have a temple, but I didn't ask for that. I asked for a tabernacle.
tabernacle that was mobile, that was temporal, that could be carried with you. And, and I think one of the reasons it was the biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes we made was because in order for us to travel pre the temple, we took the presence of God with us. Yeah. The tabernacle traveled with us in the wilderness. We took the ark to battle, you know, all these kind of like the presence of God went with us everywhere we went. Then we built the temple and we just said, all right, God, we're going to go over here. We'll come back to you eventually. And and we left God caged, the presence of God caged in this, this, this physical uh, permanent structure of the temple. Um, and so there's just something so powerful about standing on the ground where the tabernacle once stood, the temporal presence, uh, the temporal dwelling place for the presence of God, when the Brich HaDashah calls the body of Messiah, the the tabernacle, tabernacle. the temporal present, uh, dwelling place for the presence of God, it's just something, there's something unique and powerful yeah. to Shiloh that. is also where <clears throat> they divided up the, the lots of mm-hmm. land to each of the tribes took place there. Uh, Shiloh is also the place where Hannah has her, you know, she's in the tabernacle. Yeah. Shiloh is also the place where uh, Samuel's uh, kids fall away you know we yeah. have all this stuff happens in shiloh that we don't even uh pay attention to because we think that uh you know the temple and where it is in jerusalem is where all the main activities of israel took place but for hundreds of years the tabernacle was in shiloh yeah. and uh which is called shiloh by many people uh, <laughs> shala shala <clears throat> so the same people that say shekinah yeah Shekinah's those people glory. <laughs> so Anyhow, it's uh-huh. it's just important to note the Yeshua history Jesus. and that you can you can sit there in in this location and just uh, revel and and feel the the uh, the history, the presence. Now, my my two favorite experiences in Israel, uh, outside of being at Shiloh, you know that that's the Shiloh is the 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 site that I. Am looking forward to the most that I, I appreciated the most, but the the two experiences that were, uh, for all intents and purposes, for me at least, the the most, um, I think the most intriguing experiences that I had in Israel. Um, one of them was actually at the Kinneret, uh, or not the Kinneret, the uh, the um, Yard Neat, um, which is the site where, m- typically speaking, if you go to Israel and you go to do a mikvah or an immersion, a baptism in the the Jordan River, you're you're actually doing it in the Yarnit, which is this little tributary. kind of tributary of the Jordan, and it's you know this little site that you go to with the corrals, like going through a buffet to get down to the water and and what have you. But <coughs> right, um, and the reason that it's been traditionally that people get immersed in the yard and eat and not in the Jordan itself is because the cousins on the other yeah. side of the Jordan have not always been friendly, so friendly toward the people yeah. on the mm. Israel side yeah. of the Jordan. And so we, we were at the yard and eat. We were doing a, a mikvah at the yard and eat. And I had reached out to Joshua Aaron, who's a friend of mine, and I reached out to him as we were getting getting ready to uh, to go to Israel. I was like, "Hey, dude, we're going to be in Israel in a in a week or so. It'd be really awesome if you're if you're in country. It'd be really awesome if uh, you know we could get together at least for a minute, and say hello, give each other a hug, whatever, catch up." He was like, "Oh, that's great." He, he goes, "Tell me," uh, he says, "What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm going to be at the Arnit on this day." He was like, "Dude, my kids go to school at the the kibbutz across the street." He goes, uh, I, "I'll be dropping my kids off about the same time you guys are going to be there, so I'll meet you in the gift shop." Uh, uh, when you come in, just come look for me, and uh, and we'll catch up. There's a gift shop. There is. There's a gift shop every. It's wow. like surprisingly a, every every site. It's Man, like coming out of a ride at Disney. What, do you, like, sure. what can you? <laughs> sorry to interrupt, but what can you buy at the gift shop? I'm just everything, everything. that you can yeah, buy morbidly, everywhere else in Israel. Morbidly curious, <laughs> yeah. like what yeah. do you get at the immersion? Yeah, site? we call them haha shops because everything there is overpriced. Like it is at Disney. You know, yeah. you can go to Disney and buy uh, Mickey Mouse ears for $50, or you can go to a store outside of Disney yeah. and get them for 5 bucks. Yeah. yeah. That's true. And yeah. uh, so we're, we we meet up with them, and our tour guide, uh, who's a, a really good friend of ours uh, as well, but is like lives a couple of houses away from Joshua Aaron, knows his family really well. And so Joshua was there, and, and she sees him. She's like, dude, oh, this is great. You're here. You're going to lead us in worship as we go down to the Arnie. We're like, he's like, no, I, I didn't bring my guitar. I didn't bring my ukulele. I didn't bring, I wasn't prepared. I just came to see David. That was it. I just came. She was like, oh, and Shami just kept kind of kind of put the, the, the typical Jewish guilt trip on him. You got to do it. You got to do it. So finally he gave in. And so, and, and, and it was, it was interesting because we go down to the, the corrals. We get down to the water. 
I do a brief teaching on uh, on mikvah and, and why we do it and what it means and, and why we're doing it at the Jordan and so on. Uh, and there's this huge group of probably 70, 75 Brazilians that are in the water currently. I mean, they're like super Pentecostal Brazilians okay. that are in the water. They're already doing their thing. They're it's not a level their of own, Pentecostal. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're having their own worship service, their own you know thing going on down there. But uh, I, I finished my teaching and I'm like, all right, Joshua, if you want, you, you know, lead us in a song real quick. So uh, Joshua Aaron and does a, a version of um, uh, How Great Is Our God called uh, Gadol uh right? And uh, and so he, which is uh, the, the same words, but in Hebrew. And so he's like, all right, we're going to sing this. And so he leads us to sing Gadol Elohai. Well, if you know that song at all, it doesn't matter what language you speak, that melody catches your attention. Right, yeah. And a- so we're singing Gadol Elohai, and the Brazilians stop dead in their tracks and turn and face us. And we're like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. I guess we're putting on a show. So we're singing... <laughs> Uh, Gadello High, we're worshiping together and all, and then we make our way down to the the water to uh, to do our mikvah ceremony. And as we get into the water and we start doing mikvah, the Brazilians start to sing uh, "How Great Is Our God" in Portuguese over us. Wow. So it was like while they were doing their thing, inadvertently we were worshiping over them, covering them in worship and in the presence of God. And then we go down to the water and they turn around and are singing the same song in worship over us, covering us in the in presence Portuguese. of God. Wow. In Portuguese, yeah. I mean, it was just it's this awesome. really cool experience. And, you know, the, the it's a small world reality, right? Like just everything comes together in every this Every nation, moment. every tongue. Yep. yep. Uh, and then uh, the other thing was when we were on... Uh, um, Habracha, uh, or uh, Mount Gerizim, the, the Mount of Blessings, uh, we actually got to sit down on the front lawn of the Samaritan High Priest wow. uh, on the Samaritan Rosh Hashanah and have this really cool conversation for like an hour and a half, two hours on his front lawn. Uh, really weird dude. They got some really weird things that they do. They still do sacrifices and all that, so we get to see where they do their sacrifices and what have you. But but we got to sit down on his front lawn and just have a conversation with them for, for a while, which was a really cool experience. No, yeah. no. Now, to go back to the yard and eat and, and your story, we were in Israel one time and there was a big name television preacher who had a group of about 500 people that came with him to Israel. And they're down in the water and they're getting immersed and he's immersing these people. But he's got this like uh, assembly line going on where he had his bodyguard people or whatever standing in the water with him he's in a wetsuit they have a guy with an umbrella a over yeah like wet, a scuba like a full wetsuit he's got <laughs> a the guy holding he's got no, well kidding. no tank but I'm, it's a joke he's <laughs> got an umbrella over his head and they're grabbing people and kind of tossing them from one person to the <laughs> other so that it can speed through because they got 500 people they have to get through this thing oh my goodness Picture. and he's like dipping him in the water and as they're coming out the water he's like pushing them Bless. and they're bouncing out of the water <laughs> going to the next person Always. Same. And going on, it was... I picture Pike's Market and the fish. I, 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 I say blessed because I, I, I knew a guy who would, um, anytime I would say something to him, like I would text him and I'd be like, dude, something, something really encouraging or something. He was actually the producer on me and Brooks' uh, album that we recorded, uh, just a side note. And anytime we would text something, man, it sounds great. This is great. We appreciate all your work. He would just text back, bless. Yep. <laughs> so, so anyhow, uh, and I'm not mocking this, this person nor the immersions, but it was just a, a funny kind of looking at it scene yeah. as people were just being pushed from and tossed almost from one to the next so they could get 500 people That's fine. all through this immersion. Is so it they cold? Could get, is the water cold? The water is cool. And there and are, there are little fish. Fish in there. And there are big catfish in yeah. there. You know uh, when you, you you see the videos of people like they're they're getting the uh, pedicures with the little fish that are like it, it's like that but they're everywhere and oh, they're wow. all over like your legs they're like, like minnow like type fish. right and the bottom is all stones so and not all round stones so it's not the most <laughs> yeah. comfortable place to so walk bring sandals yeah. when you yeah. go yeah. unless you step on a fish and then it's a little squishy yeah, so you right. know you need to wear your wetsuit with flippers and actually all I have that to stuff. say uh, one of my friends who's been to Israel a couple times um, he told me because i love to have this thing for books and especially what i call shiny books so really nice leather you know bound bibles and sidereem and he was telling me he's like man jerusalem has tons of these used bookstores you just go in and it's just like shelves of these and you can buy yeah, every kind of sidereem from the you know, ashkenazi sephardic you know you can buy tanox you know um you know sometimes you'll run across a store that may have um the the bibles with the british on it but it's you know those are there's usually a little less so uh 
But I was like, man, that would be something I'd, I'd definitely yeah, Israel look forward to doing. Israel has some unique things. For instance, you can still haggle in Israel and many of the shops. Yeah, where David. I would, I would haggle over that. some sort You go in and sure. you haggle down. Also, um, David haggled some guy from like a thousand bucks to like 30 bucks like over something, some blanket or something. And, and the, the funny thing is I wasn't even haggling. I didn't want it. He was walking <laughs> he away. me saying right. no. If, as if, you're the, if, you're, if you're the first person oh, in a more. store in the morning. They're, they really want to sell you something because it's uh, a good sign for the rest of the day. But also, we go to a diamond factory in Israel almost every time we go in the evening. After we tour, after we have dinner, we go to a diamond factory. Just to and, see how the diamonds yeah, are? Yeah, they teach, show you how they cut the diamonds, how they polish them. And then they have a, a jewelry store that you go into. Right. And they'll sell you jewelry on a handshake. Like, I, I wow. went in there and I got a ring for my wife, and I said, look, I, I the banks are closed today because it would happen to be... The Hasidim in the Diamond District right. in Manhattan do the exact yeah. same thing. Yeah, you just, you go in and, like, I they let me take this diamond ring home to my, my wife and then mail them a check in. Just on, on, crazy. on a handshake. And the same thing, there's some art shops. We went to an art shop where the, the guy said, if you want it, just take it and send me... You know, shake my hand it, that's, uh, and, and take it. That's so that's really putting your neck out there. Yeah, it's kind of interesting the trust level that's with a handshake in Israel that isn't quite the same here in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's a different world. I, I've been not to take it away from Israel, but I've been mikvah uh, as far as in. After I was missing, I was baptized when I was uh, in the church, uh, in like a baptismal in the back of our sanctuary, or, or I guess it was behind the pulpit, not in the yeah. back. So it was in the very, it was behind the pulpit. It was this um, like a and, Baptist, yeah. And the water, was, it was like a big tub, yeah, yeah. And the water was like super warm. I remember I wore my socks for some reason. I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway, because you always have socks on, <laughs> and I had broken my finger. And my mom didn't want me to get my cast and all wet, but I was like, "She's like, just raise your arm up out of it." I'm like, "No, I want, I want, I want, every, I want my whole body to go in the water." But so that was the first time. But uh, I've been mikvah twice uh, since I've I've been in the movement. One was which, it, which finger? Because now I've got like a picture of George Costanza chasing my, the dude down on side. My left hand. I slammed <laughs> my left hand. I slammed a car door on it. It was my left my left hand. My middle finger. Anyway, so. It's a wonder we get through these conversations. Yeah, I know. Some of the side comments. So, so, so and it was I, the middle finger. But, but, but I, I got Mikvah in a lake in Savannah when I went mm-hmm. to Karenor. Uh, I was uh, serving uh, under Rabbi Jude Caracello. And uh, and I got Mikvah in a river in uh, Georgia, in North Georgia, by a friend of mine uh, named Joseph Riverwind. But um, he, he's Native American. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that name before. For That's those who are curious, he did some worship with Joshua. Aaron. He did, yeah, yeah. And okay, he's done some so stuff we're thinking the same thing. Oh Carl. gosh, yeah. yeah. I, 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 when I met, I met Joseph Riverwind when I was uh, in Macon, but um, we went, we, we struck a close friendship. So we visited his home. He lived near a reservation, and he took us to this river. And I don't know, just the spirit of God came, and I was like, man, Joseph, I, I just feel led for you to immerse me right now, you know. And he prayed over me and immersed me. It was a really beautiful moment, but uh, it was freezing cold and. And and again, the stones really round. But when I got mikvah in uh, in in Savannah, uh, Rabbi Jew took us to this lake, and it was like to my like I got into the lake, of course, but to my ankles in like sludge, like whatever the crap was on the bottom of that lake, it was like to my ankles. When I, so it was so nasty. <laughs> so God. so you <laughs> such so an the, oxymoron. It's like <laughs> it's like naming. Can't, can't we go to a clean river in Assyria? So the conversation on on Mikvah brings up an interesting question, and we can maybe use this as our last discussion on this uh, on this episode. Um, and you know, Rabbi Eric was telling the story of the fish market style Mikvah, where they're just throwing people down the line to get them to the guy that's, that's dunking them uh, and, and all that. But uh, Rabbi Eric, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you uh, dive into this question and actually answer the historical side of it and all that. But you know, in, in Judaism, that's typically not how a Mikvah is done. It's kind of a hands off by the the people yeah. uh, uh, that are kind of overseeing right. it. So the if way you'll talk about the, yeah. the differences between like the Christian perspective of a, a baptism and, and the Jewish perspective of a mikvah. Well, there, there are several differences. One is that in Judaism, mikvah isn't a one-time thing. Uh, it's a preparation for entering into a holy space. Yep. So in the Orthodox community, people will go through mikvah every, before every Shabbat yep. so that they're uh, also before weddings, after an illness. There's there's many times where people go through immersion because it's a part of the ritual cleansing 
uh, that is part of Judaism in commemorating going to the temple when they would get mikvah or go through tevila before going into the temple. But it's also done in traditional way with no clothes on. Uh, and and supervised by the attendant yep. who doesn't put their hands on you, and but it has are, to be living water. Right, has to be living water. Has to be over 150 gallons of water. Can has you explain to be able like to drain. A, Can you explain like living water in case somebody? Right, it, it has to be water that can not be stagnated. In other words, if it's in a tank, the tank has to be able to be completely emptied out. In other words, if if the drain has to be at the lowest yep. point in the tank and the water has to be refreshed constantly. And typically, in an Orthodox synagogue, it would actually be tapped into like an aquifer or right. something underwater, yeah. Right, I mean, so, that, so that it's living water, fresh water. It's not stagnant or still water. Gotcha. Uh, so, and then you go in the water and you dunk yourself under the water. Now, traditionally, it's done three times for Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov or for the Kohanim, the Levites, and the and the regular Israelites, but uh, three times of, of being immersed under the water. Uh, so, and, and that's, by the way, how we do it at our synagogue. We go out we do to... As well, yeah. Uh, the water, either the bay or the ocean or sometimes a river, and the person or people go out in the water, and then they pray. We say a barucha, a prayer over the people, but then they pray themselves, and when they've connected spiritually in the way that they desire to or feel led to, then they put themselves under the water. And it's the attendant's job just to make sure they get fully under the water and that they come back out of the water. Uh, <laughs> right. it's, it's important. When, the head count's important. Yeah, the head count is important. There's lots of times where we have, you know, 15, 20, 25 people that go out to the water. So we count them when they go out, and then we count how many come back. So we make sure that everybody goes out, comes back in. But that's part of, uh, of how it's done. So uh, the church has, in a large way, made it something that... Uh, immersion or baptism is a one-time thing, not part of a regular life, uh, and also that it's something where somebody puts you under the water and puts you back up. In Judaism, you do it yourself, and there so that it's you doing a hundred percent of what you're doing. Right. It's not someone else having involvement in your decision, but you are completely committed to this decision, and you put yourself under the water, and then you come back out of the water. And when uh, in John chapter 3, when it talks about how can I be born anew or born again, can I enter into my mother's womb, that whole series of verses about you must be born again is talking about immersion. It's talking about right. water baptism. It's talking about you go into the water one way, you come out of the water another. You go into the water single, you come out married. You go into the water sick, you come out well. You go into the water a sinner, you come out of the water washed Oh, with, with your sins washed away. That's why when Paul is speaking, it says, Arise and be immersed in the name of the Lord, washing away your sins. Now, how that works, I don't know. I don't know how when I go in a bathtub and I take a bath or I go in a swimming pool and just go swimming, it doesn't have any spiritual ramifications to my life. But when I present myself to God and I go through the waters of immersion, there's a supernatural thing that happens that brings about a supernatural spiritual change. It's the intention, I think, yeah. uh, behind it. Yeah, so, God honoring that, absolutely. So that's uh, so. when we go to the Yard Neat, and actually on our trip this year, we're going to the actual Jordan, to the location that the archaeologists and such believe is where uh, Yeshua actually got immersed, where uh, John the Immerser, Yochanan Amabil, was doing the immersions, where the Israelites crossed uh, from Jordan into the land. Uh, of course, it wasn't called Jordan at the time. Uh, into the land, uh, all that took place. We're actually going to be, place. yeah, we're actually going to be immersing people in the Jordan itself, and not in the yard neat this time. So it's pretty exciting to be yeah. doing that a little different this year. Cool. I hope this has been a blessing. I hope that you'll pay attention to both uh, information about the upcoming intercongregational cruise, which will be. Co- uh, coming up next year and also for our next trip to israel if you've never been to israel we encourage you to go with a messianic rabbi so you'll get the perspective of somebody who's looking from a hebraic and a biblical uh, perspective at the scriptures and that you'll come with us if the opportunity presents itself thank you so much and shalom Thank you for listening to the Messiantics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messiantics Podcast.